This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Tomorrow is Election Day. Polls open at 6 a.m. in Connecticut. But in Bridgeport, there's a matter to resolve before voters cast their ballots. Coming up, Brian Lockhart, reporter for the Connecticut Post, will join us to explain why the Connecticut Supreme Court will hold a hearing later today in Hartford, centered on the outcome of Bridgeport's mayoral primary. Is it possible the results of the September 10th primary could be thrown out over claims of illegal balloting? More on that in just a little bit. We're going to check in on several races this hour, and we also want to hear from you. Do you plan on voting in your city or town's municipal elections tomorrow? What issue or race is bringing you to the polls? Join us, 888-720-9677. That's 888-720-WMPR. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Uh, We're going to start with Hartford. So joining us today uh, by phone is Rebecca Lurie, a Hartford city reporter at the Hartford Current. Uh, Rebecca, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Good morning. So voters in Hartford, they have the mayor's race to think about, but also uh, city council. Before we get to that, just remind us again, uh, you know, often in Democratic majority cities uh, like Hartford, uh, the winner of the primary is the likely winner in the general election. So uh, Luke Bronin uh, winning in September's primary. Uh, Does he have anything to worry about tomorrow in terms of uh, what's going to happen, Rebecca, with the way the voters are going to cast their ballots? So all along, he's been saying that he's, you know, not going to take anything for granted, but he is probably heavily favored to win. It's unlikely that he'll lose, um, but he does have a candidate on row B who's running against him, um, Jay Stan McCauley, who has gained um, a lot of traction in the last, uh, you know, few weeks after the primary uh, because he didn't run against him in the primary. And so he was just sort of building support over that time. The other candidates he has also run against him. Uh, for other people, including, you know, former Mayor Eddie Perez, but he lost in the primary. So it's pretty, uh, pretty long shot that he would get more votes in this round. So Eddie Perez is a petitioning candidate on the uh, general election ballot? He is. He's on road J, the very last row. He says that is a good place to be. <laughs> um, and he, you know, he got enough signatures to land on the ballot, even though he did not win the primary. And you mentioned uh, uh, J. Stan McCauley. So tell us more. So he's actually running on the on the Republican line. Uh, is that surprising uh, for him, who is, again, a longtime activist, uh, um, who has a television company in Hartford, uh, somebody that uh, people know his name, uh, but not quite uh, the kind of campaign to, to beat someone like Luke Bronin? I don't think people are necessarily surprised to see him on the Republican line. They are more uh He's having to explain that he's not a Republican. He's a Democrat. He's run for mayor before, twice, one time as a Republican, and uh, the next time as a Democrat. So he, you know, he, he says he was cross endorsed by the Republican Town Committee. Um, he says this is the last time that he is running for mayor. Uh, he <laughs> has gained um, a lot of support from longtime Hartford residents and, and organizers and activists, as well as kind of the the new crop of people who are maybe dissatisfied with the the progress they're seeing outside of downtown in Hartford. Mm. Uh, tell us more about that. You mentioned uh, incumbent mayor Luke Bronin is not taking anything for granted. Uh, is there a lot of dis- dissatisfaction uh, with uh, Bronin's time as mayor? And what are you hearing? Well, you do see a lot of people who are happy with how things are going as far as the, the city's financial situation improving. Um, there are big businesses coming to Hartford. There is redevelopment. And then there's some dis- disagreement about how much of that is due to Luke Bronin and how much of that is um, kind of things that have been in the works for a long time or, or side effects of some of the things that he's uh, been able to do. So there, there is there's always going to be people who are <laughs> not happy, um, but there are people who are making pretty good arguments that things haven't improved in the schools, for example. They're not much better than they were four years ago, or that the neighborhoods are still seeing, you know, high rates of violence, or, you know, poverty is just as, you know, bad as it always has been. So he's managed to um, bring on, he's formed a transition team, um, which is something he hasn't done in the past, and that's included, you know, the, the former mayor, Thurman Milner, who's a major name in Hartford, um, 
a member of the Commission on Human Rights and Opportunities, the president of the Blue Hill Civic Association. So some some important people in Hartford. You're hearing Rebecca Lurie, who is a reporter for the Hartford Current. She covers the city of Hartford as we look at the municipal uh, races uh, with Election Day tomorrow. Uh, you can join our conversation, 888-720-9677, or you can find us on Facebook and Twitter, uh, at Where We Live. So uh, Luke Bronin uh, on the ballot, uh, Jay Stan McCauley, and then you mentioned some other petitioning candidates, one being Eddie Perez. Uh, but tell us about the other people interested in uh, becoming uh, Hartford's next uh, mayor, even though they have uh, quite an uphill battle uh, to get there. Of course. So Michael Downs um, has run for mayor several times, dating back many years. He is the president of the Hartford uh, Substitute Teachers Union, which does exist. Um, You have Giselle Jacobs, who works uh, for the um, (laughs) – sorry, she owns an environmental and commercial cleaning company and lead inspection service also a veteran. Um, she's been you know, the assistant director of Hartford's Minority Construction Council. Uh, Aaron Lewis is the founder of a literacy organization called the Scribes Institute, and he's also been a major advocate of educational improvements in Hartford. I mean, he actually, oh. he's a little interesting. He changed his political affiliation earlier this year from Democrat to Libertarian, though he did it too late for that to actually appear on the ballot. We mentioned uh, city council races, uh, Rebecca, a lot of candidates on the Hartford ballot. Uh, what can you tell us about um, the, the seats up for grabs and some candidates that are you know, standing out among the 16? Yeah, we have um, room for some new faces no matter what happens. There are you know, three of the current Democrats running on the Democratic slate and one working for parties um, incumbent running on that slate. So a lot of uh, newcomers. Um, so, and that's because our current council president and one of the working families members are stepping down, and a couple others didn't win, win endorsement this year. So, John Gale, for instance, is the Democrat incumbent who's running as a uh, petitioning party, basically under a new party, and he um, has out fundraised all of his competitors. So, it is pretty possible that he could win his seat back, just not on the Democratic you know, majority. And then you have like seven people who are all running as a uh, non, um, you know, majority party members. Uh, you have two Republicans, Gary Bazzano and Ted Cannon, who are running um, a Green Party candidate, Mary Sanders, who has a lot of experience leading a nonprofit in New Britain. Uh, but the, the Democrats as well, I mean, they've there's really not any way to know, you know, who is going to come out on top of that. But people have been very interested because that will that will mean a lot about the next few years. Mm-hmm. Hartford has a charter review coming up. And so whether the council does what Luke Bronin wants will make a big difference. What is the dynamic between uh, I mentioned you mentioned that there are some new uh, there's some room for some uh, newcomers on the city council. But uh, with uh, Mayor Bronin's first term, you know, what's the dynamic? And, you know, with the the city council having uh, some new faces, could this be a challenge for Bronin if he does uh, become a mayor for another term? The council has, has generally done what he's you know wanted to do, which is not necessarily um you know, to say that there's not disagreements or pushback happening behind closed doors, but generally you go to a council meeting and, and things just sort of already decided this is what we're pushing, you know, to another week again for like the 10th time, or this is what we're going to act on today. Um, so they're doing most of their discussion in these caucuses. Uh, the <laughs> the majority of resolutions are put, forth, put forward by Luke Bronin. Um, and then there are some people running right now who say that it just seems like the mayor gets what he wants and that there needs to be people on council who will question him. So, it, And then there's others who say, like, that Nick LeBron is one of the Democratic candidates who would be new on council if he's elected. He says that it's not true, that the, the mayor just is handed whatever he wants. He says it's not a rubber stamp for him and that it is happening behind closed doors. There needs to be more transparency. That's Rebecca Lurie, who's a reporter at the Hartford Current. Uh, Rebecca, uh, thank you for joining us uh, to give us an update on all the names on the uh, ballot before Hartford voters tomorrow. Of course. Thank you.
Uh, this is where we live as we take time again to check in on uh, several municipal races uh, happening in cities and towns. Uh, uh, we don't have time to talk about all of them, but we wanted to highlight some of them. So I wanted to uh, bring into the conversation now uh, Paul Bass, who's editor of the New Haven Independent. Paul, welcome back to the show. Good morning, Lucy. So nice to talk to you. Uh, so the the primary uh, results, September 10th, certainly interesting. Uh, Justin Elliker was the victor. Uh, the incumbent, Tony Harp, saying that she would suspend her campaign uh, after the primary. And then you guys broke news uh, recently that Harp unsuspended her campaign. So what's going on in New Haven and why did that happen? Well, in New Haven, we have an upside down race. It's going against every rule that conventional wisdom dictates campaigns should run by. We have a three-term incumbent, Tony Hart. She, as you mentioned, she lost the Democratic primary. She's running on the Working Families Party line. The Working Families Party is not backing her, despite giving her the line because they wanted her for the primary. Justin Ellicott is seeking to unseat her. She's a politician who's been in office for 32 years, very popular in many offices. He's running as the Democrat now in the general election with the party establishment's backing. And the two of them are campaigning in a way that at first glance would defy the way candidates usually run. So Elliker's trying to unseat a candidate, but in the general election, he hasn't issued a single flyer, made a single public statement criticizing the incumbent. Now, in the primary, he went heavy on it. He criticized her for mismanaging government, for an FBI ethics probe, for the schools falling up, the schools being mismanaged and being a, a you know, complete dysfunction, three superintendents in three years. And he went hard on that, and that was the message of change. Now he's not doing that anymore. And Hart, meanwhile, the conventional wisdom is that if you lose a primary, you try to get new voters if you want to win in a general election. So in the primary, she concentrated. She's African-American. He's white. She went just in the black community in the primary, and she even lost ground in the black community. Um, Justin Ellicott had run against her before, and he got thousands of more votes than he got before, and people stay home in the black community. He won a, he won a lot. So the conventional wisdom was she shouldn't run in the general election because her best shot was the primary. We have 40,000 registered Democrats and another 19,000 Republicans and independents. In the past, those votes went heavily to Ellicott. The conventional wisdom is they go for Ellicott. But Hart had every reason to say, hey, I'm going to make my case. I'm coming back in a general election. But what's interesting is she's not going for those votes. Mm. She is campaigning only in the black community. And they even had a rally on Sunday, which only 40 people showed up for, where they attacked white women for not backing her, like in a big way. Mm. So people try to figure out what this is about. You, you know, we got to be careful in the punditocracy because we said Donald Trump had no way of losing. I believe the poll said 99% he couldn't win. And in that case, too, you know, they trying to stoke race so that and all that. So no one can figure out how she could win when she lost pretty steadily 58 to 42 percent in a primary where she supposedly had the advantage, and now you're going to a general election. And when she's not trying to take an advantage with the new voters, but you got to, she's believing that she was unfairly um, portrayed. She's running the way she started her campaign against the Democratic establishment of her career. She started in 1987 on a slate called the Progressive Alliance that was African-American Democrats and Green Party candidates who ran a fusion slate on two parties. And now she's running against the same party establishment. And what's interesting is that the Democratic town chair they, they targeted in 1987 was the late father of the current Democratic Party chair who they're trying to make the villain. So this three repeats itself. Uh, tell me more about uh, who's backing Harp again uh, in this uh, change of mind that she had uh, unsuspending her campaign. Uh, Reverend uh, Kimber comes to mind, uh, pastor of First Calvary Baptist Church. He, you know, he uh, wrote something, uh, an op-ed in the New Haven Register, uh, equating people who didn't support Harp to, to Trump. What's that about? Yeah, he's saying it's a white takeover of the city because a black woman lost. It's kind of interesting because black voters really didn't want to vote for Harp, so many who had voted for her in the past. But, right, for her, it's a very small group supporting her. A lot of her people who are close to her said, do not run. But she had every right to run. She wanted to run. So they got iced out. And it's a very small group. It's primarily African-American who have jobs with the city or personal connections with her over a career, tend to be older. Um, but, again, there's a big African-American support now for Ellicott as well. 
So, but yeah, her support is people either loyal to her because she's had a great career, done a lot. Um, she was a state senator, leading state senator. First two of us three terms as mayor, had a lot of successes. So it's kind of the hardcore of um, people with a personal connection. The unions who got there had dropped away. Uh, they came out publicly at an elevator event, although I don't know how hard they worked for them. So the people actually pulled her vote in the primary and not backing her. But there's a core of people, primarily over 50 African American, who know her from her long career, who stuck with her and said, We owe it to her because she's done so much and this new guy hasn't been around long. So let's stay with her. Mm. Well, what's turnout uh, expected to be tomorrow, Paul, in New Haven? Well, the last time the two of them faced each other, there were 21,000 votes. No one I speak to thinks there were many this time because that was after 20 years of a previous mayor and a campaign that saw heavy campaigning with lots of people on both sides working the doors. Given that's not happened, I would be surprised if we see more than 15,000 votes. But we'll see. There were um, were about 13,000 votes in the primary. Let's turn our attention uh, to... I'm sorry, 12,300 in the primary. Uh, Thank you, Paul. Let's turn our attention to Hamden, because uh, similar to New Haven, you've got uh, two Democrats running against each other uh, in tomorrow's general election. Tell us about uh, that race in Hamden. Yeah, no, general election to Republican against a Democrat, J.K. against Kurt Lane. Kurt Lane's the um, incumbent. It's a very Democratic town, so all K is like he's a newcomer. I don't think that many people expect him to win, unless it's a big upset. But on the city council, there's a very interesting race of Democrats against Democrats called the Legislative Council. And as in Hartford, they have minority set-aside seats, mm. meaning one party can't have all the seats. The, uh, there has to be a second a minority party. The next party that gets the most votes gets a couple seats. So that's always been Republicans. But now members of the Working Families Party, a ticket of two people, Ron Nicola and Lori Sweet, they're running very hard as working family candidates trying to beat the Republicans for those two seats. And uh, they're saying they're registered Democrats, but the Working Families Party is Democrats who want to push the party to the left. Although it's more complicated in Hamden, they want to push it to the left on policing and immigration policy, but not on fiscal policy. They want to go more conservative. But in any case, it's raised two interesting questions that I think are good statewide questions because Hartford and other places have similar rules. When you have a minority party provision so that you have diversity in government, should it have to be Democrats and Republicans? Because a lot of people think it should, which I always thought was a, in this country, I mean, in the state, the laws are written, which I think it would be antitrust violations in business, which is Democrats and Republicans guarantee that their people have to have seats like register our voters in Hartford. And when a, when a working family party person won there, you had to have three because Republicans were guaranteed a seat even though they didn't get the votes. So similarly here, some people say, well, if the working family party wins in hand, then you've really gone around the intent by having one party get all the seats. And some Democrats don't want them to run because they say you're going to split our vote and help more Republicans win. However, the working family people argue, why does diversity have to mean conservative and center liberal. Why can't it be left and center liberal? Mm -hmm. So I think it's a very fair argument, um, and that has good arguments on both sides. And as I said, gets to the core of what we mean by having competition built into our local government so that there can be diversity of opinion and accountability. Uh, in Hamden, do you feel like there are a lot of residents who are engaged with these races? Uh, we see um, colleagues reporting on, uh, you know, lawn signs, and getting a lot of attention, uh, trying to gauge interest. What's your take, Paul? My take is that um, there are a lot of people who've gotten more involved in politics in general in Hamden since the 2016 election because of Trump with Indivisible and all that. I don't know that this is the most hectic campaign you've seen. I don't think that mayoral race appears to be as competitive as it might be, although I could be wrong about that. As I said, we can't predict elections anymore. I think of some of these individual races like West Woods, which is a neighborhood near Quinnipiac University, where you have pockets like that where you have very competitive races. I don't think it's a town-wide phenomenon. Paul Bass, again, is editor of the New Haven Independent. Uh, Paul, always a pleasure to speak with you. We'll be uh, checking out your coverage uh, tomorrow. Thank you. Same here, Lucy. This is where we live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Coming up, we're going to continue to check in on municipal races in Connecticut. That's because tomorrow, November 5th, is Election Day. Polls open at 6 a.m. You can join us, too. Uh, What's making you come out uh, to your town or city to vote? Uh, Maybe you're sitting this one out. We want to hear from you as well. 888-720-9677 or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live.
This is where we live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nopithanchel. The general election is tomorrow. Coming up, we're going to talk about Bridgeport, where election drama is happening yet again, less than 24 hours before voters head to the polls. An appeal surrounding claims of illegal balloting has now landed the issue before the Connecticut Supreme Court. We're going to talk about that in just a few minutes. First, there's an interesting race happening in Danbury where longtime mayor Mark Boughton faces a strong challenge from a Democrat. For more, joining us by phone is Al Robinson, author of the Hat City blog. Al, thanks for joining us today. Good morning, Lucy. Thanks for, thanks for uh, having me on the show. So Mark Boughton, he's been mayor, I believe, since 2001. Uh, why is this race uh, setting up to be a little bit different uh, than uh, in past elections for him? Well, um, one of the, the, the biggest factor is that in past elections, uh, Mark hasn't had a real strong challenger uh, with somebody with, with Chris Otero. Um, the other challenges that he had in the past were unable to raise a lot of money, didn't have a lot of support, and were, weren't really able to run a really effective campaign. Chris, um, by contrast, has raised an awful lot of money. In fact, um, he's basically dollar for dollar raised about as much money as, uh, as Mark has. I think they're both at $170,000 now which uh, for a Democrat is unheard of. I, I, I think Chris has raised the most money um, ever for a Democratic uh, candidate for mayor. And I think uh, another uh, factor that, that, that I think the Democrats here are running on is that there's been a, um, I think the, 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 the election last year, and primarily in this area where you had, um, especially in the state Senate District uh, 24, where Julie Kushner beat Mike McLaughlin, um, and the uh, 138th, where Ken Gucker uh, won for state representative, uh, Democrats had a very successful, successful election last year, and I think they're they're banking on that type of turnout and that type of enthusiasm and the work they put into the election last year to um, tr- translate into a. Uh, a possibility of a good victory yeah. uh, this year. So you mentioned Democrat Chris Sotero. What can you tell us about him? Chris Sotero was a long-term Democrat. Uh, he was a member, uh, in fact, he ran um, for mayor back in 2001 against Mark Fountain. Um, they had a very close contest. I think Mark won by about 150 votes in the end. Um, Chris has been a member of the city council back in the 1990s. He was a council president um, um, on the council when uh, Gene Eriquez was mayor. So he had a lot he had a lot of connections to being a very well-known uh, person at the proper name ID that you would need to have to run an effective campaign here in this area. One of the big things about Danbury is that it, 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 uh, your name and your lineage to the city carries a lot of weight. Mm. And people know who Chris Sotero is. And, um, they, he, he very well, well-known family, and he's been around for a long time. So it's, and it's actually reflective in the enthusiasm that the uh, people in this area had towards his campaign. So I think he has a pretty good shot. Um, Do you get the sense that uh, Mayor Boughton is worried? I mean, how has he been campaigning uh, the last couple of months? Well, I I think, you know, um, I wouldn't, I I don't know if worried is the best term to use. I would say that he is running like he has to earn this seat, which is refreshing for a change because we had so many elections where the mayor didn't have to run really hard because he didn't really have candidate, really effective candidates to uh, run against. In fact, there was two elections, I think 2011 and 2015, where the Democratic Town Committee was unable to even find a candidate. So um, Mark has been a, Mark has to, you know, finally you know, run and, and run and earn this seat. So he's out there and campaigning as hard as he can. And he's running a good campaign. I'm, I'm not discounting his campaign one bit. I think they're both running a good campaign. I think they're both running on issues that people want to talk about. And it's just refreshing for finally in this area that we have two candidates out there campaigning and listening to the voters and talking about issues that are on the people's minds, such as education and transportation, two big issues that are happening in this area. Uh, you uh, you guessed my next question. You mentioned issue uh, education and transportation are, are two big issues. Uh, can you briefly tell us uh, you know, what, how are residents thinking about those uh, two very important uh, topics? Um, well, when it comes to education, we, we just uh, recently learned that the, um, there's a big issue with overcrowding in the schools here. In fact, uh, the, the, the number of freshmen students at Danbury High uh, went way beyond what was predicted. So um, overcrowding of the school system has always been a, t- a topic of concern. Um, unfortunately, we never had candidates who really addressed those concerns. And Chris is actually doing a good job. He's running his entire um, – most of his campaign, he keeps hitting on the issue of education and how um, that issue needs to be addressed. And 
Um, that's one big issue. The other issue would be um, transportation on roads. Chris has been out there campaigning on um, a road system. Uh, the roads need to be paved and the traffic concerns that are happening in this area. And he's trying to paint the picture as Mark has been ineffective in this area and he wants to come and bring, which is bring change. And one of his major things is change. So he's running on that. And um, we'll, we'll see tomorrow how that works out. Uh, when you've been talking uh, with uh, people in Danbury, again, uh, interesting race, a close race. Uh, do you think that turnout will be uh, larger than expected for a municipal race? Yes. Again, it goes back to um, it goes back to what I said previously, that in terms of the Democrats, they've never really had a good challenge to the mayor. Uh, the mayor has been in office since 2001. Uh, for the exception of maybe 2005, where it was somewhat close, um, they really had they had the mayor really had really had never had a challenge to his uh, to his uh, to his seat. Chris is someone who is different. It's shown by the amount of money that he's raised. It's, I'm seeing the amount of enthusiasm from the uh, from the people in the streets, uh, from the camp, camp campaign operation that he's running. Now, I'm not saying that this will result in him winning, but I'm saying that this should. If, if last year is in the case, if last year's election and the turnout that happened last year, any indication of what could happen tomorrow, we could have an interesting race. I, I think that Chris has done everything he can do to wage an effective challenge to Mark. And it's yet to be seen if that would be enough to take Mark out of office. I don't think so, but I think it will be a very close race. That's uh, Al Robinson, author of the Hat City blog. We'll link to his blog at our website, wmpr.org slash where we live. Al Robinson, thanks again for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Uh, This is where we live from Connecticut Public Radio. Again, we're taking time to uh, focus on some of the municipal races happening tomorrow. You can join us as well, 888-720-9677. What particular race in your town or city is going to make you go out to the polls? Or conversely, uh, maybe you're sitting this one out. Of course, we want to hear from you about that, considering how um, municipal races are so impactful uh, to uh, residents. Uh, These are the races, these are the kinds of elections that you want to come out for. But you can join us, 888-720-9677. We do want to hear from you as well. We've been teasing you uh, for the part of the hour about Bridgeport, uh, election drama happening uh, in Bridgeport. So joining us now via Skype is Brian Lockhart, uh, who covers Bridgeport. Uh, And Brian, you joined us for our candidate interviews uh, just a few months ago. Uh, Welcome back. Having me back, Lucy. So what's happening in Bridgeport? So Joe Gannon, we know, uh, won September's primary uh, because of absentee ballots, and there were claims about fraud. And now I mentioned this is before the Connecticut Supreme Court. So update us. So, yes, we head into tomorrow, and Joe Gannon is obviously the favorite. He has all the advantages right now. Um, he has the t- He has a spot on the ballot, which Marilyn Moore does not have. He has the top ballot spot. He also has the Democratic machine behind him. There was a sort of a unity rally last night. Um, Senator Blumenthal was there. Congressman Heim was, was there. Nancy Wyman, um, Nancy Wyman was there um, from, is, the, from the state Dems. Is that surprising? Um, honestly, no. You know, all of these folks really rely on Bridgeport. I mean, we see it time and again in statewide elections, gubernatorial races, congressional races. Um, where the cities and the Democrats in those cities are often um, the deciding votes for some really close races um, when you have Republicans appealing to the suburbs. And so it's not a surprise. I mean, this is, you know, it, it's 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 party unity. I mean, this is what is expected of elected officials who say that they are part of a party. Um so we do have we do have an expedited Supreme Court hearing. State Supreme Court hearing today, um, Marilyn Moore's supporters who had sought to toss, have a Superior Court judge toss out the results of the September 10th primary between herself and Joe Gannam and order a new primary. Um, they lost that bid in court late last week, and so they filed for an appeal, and the Supreme Court agreed to take it up. Um, they are supposed to have their briefs in by 10 a.m. this morning, and I think oral arguments are scheduled to begin around 2 p.m., um, you know, it, it seems like an uphill battle in terms of in terms of the Supreme Court suddenly putting the brakes on all of this. And but, you know, stranger things have happened. I mean, there's um, it wasn't that long ago, a little over a year ago, where 
um, a superior court judge actually ordered two city council primaries to be done over because of um, absentee ballot irregularities. And that case went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court sided with the superior court judge. Um, so it's it's not it wouldn't be it wouldn't be nuts for that to happen. Um, it's happened before, but it does seem like right now Ganem has the advantage and it's sort of a Hail Mary effort. Uh, remind us again when we talk about some of the the claims uh, surrounding the September 10th primary in Bridgeport. Again, uh, Joe Gannum uh, won that race by 270 votes, uh, thanks to a three to one edge in absentee ballots. What did uh, what was uncovered after that primary that is really at the heart of, of this appeal now being heard before the Connecticut Supreme Court today? So. We had done an investigation ourselves, and then parallel to that, some folks who support Marilyn Moore, including a civic group called Generation Now, um, they did their own they did their own um, investigation, which resulted in the filing of the lawsuit. And you know, when we say irregularities or absentee ballot abuse, it kind of falls into a couple major categories. There are people who say that they were told to vote for a particular candidate. Um, that's that's a no-no. I mean, absentee ballots are certainly, you know, they're certainly handled differently than when you go to the voting machines. But when you go to the voting machines, you don't have somebody, you don't have somebody peeking over the cubicle telling you, hey, fill out that bubble for so-and-so candidate. And so um, that's one of the allegations is that some of the folks, some of the campaign people who circulate um, absentee ballot applications and then follow up on those applications to make sure that the the actual ballots are filled out. We're pressuring voters to back specific candidates. Um, There's also allegations that people that do not qualify for absentee ballots were provided applications and were allowed to vote by absentee ballot. And um, part, part of the problem with that is the there are tons of states all over the country um, Connecticut's actually in the minority on this, I believe, that have no excuse absentee balloting. So you can, for whatever reason, if you decide you don't want to head to the polls on election day, you can fill out an absentee or a mail-in ballot. Connecticut doesn't have that. We have six very specific reasons for not showing up on election day. Illness, um, you're in the military service, you're going to be out of state all day for work, you're disabled. So... And there are some gray areas there. And so um, some folks, as you know, some of these irregularities are people that just shouldn't, they, they, for all intents and purposes, they should have been able to show up on September 10th at the polls, but instead they voted by absentee ballot. So that's another, um, that's another thing that's under scrutiny in this lawsuit. Brian Lockhart is with us via Skype. He covers Bridgeport for the Connecticut Post. Uh, before uh, voters head to the polls tomorrow for the general election, uh, the state Supreme Court is actually uh, holding a hearing today uh, to address uh, what we've just been talking about, a question surrounding the September 10th primary and claims about illegal absentee balloting. So I'm just curious, Brian, if you could tell our listeners specifically what will the Supreme Court try to answer today uh, with this hearing later in Hartford? Well, essentially, the judge, the superior court judge in Bridgeport, determined that there were some significant issues that were uncovered or that were presented to him in the court case, but they didn't rise to the level of tossing out the results of the September 10th primary. Because remember, Joe Gannam won by um, 200 plus votes. And so Basically, the judge said, look, there are some, you know, there are some questionable things here, but you have not presented me evidence that would disqualify all of those votes that Joe Gannam won by. And so that's one of the, you know, that's one of the things that the Supreme Court is going to be looking at in the appeal. Um, Again, it's. You know, I, I'm not and I'll be honest with you, I'm not even sure how that would work if the Supreme Court today somehow upheld the appeal and ordered a new primary. Um, what does that mean for tomorrow? I don't even think we've gotten that mm-hmm. far. Um, there's a lot of complexities here because it's not just Joe Gannam, who's on the ballot tomorrow and Marilyn Moore, who's obviously a write in candidate. There are there's a Republican candidate on the ballot. 
the Republicans aren't part of this. Um, if you're a member of the Republican Party, are you going to be saying, well, well, wait a minute, why did why why should our election why should this election be on hold? We're not a part of this. There's council members. Um, there's board of education members. There's a lot of other municipal elections tomorrow besides this mayoral race. And so there's a lot of other people that are going to be impacted by a decision to kind of put everything on hold and have a do over primary. So that's kind of a big question lingering over this. And, and that's actually another reason why I'm 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 a little bit skeptical that the Supreme Court will decide in favor of um, the more supporters, because there's just it really does seem like a, a, a literal can of worms if mm-hmm. they do that. And there's also the question of how uh, Marilyn Moore uh, handled her campaign, uh, telling everyone that she was going to be on the Working Families Party, but then uh, finding out that she didn't have enough signatures, which was not a very hard thing to do. I mean, what is uh, the take uh, of Bridgeport residents, well, ones who aren't uh, loyal to Joe Gannam, of course, with this idea that, um, you know, should she have uh, just ran a better race? Yes, that that is absolutely a fair question. Um her, she and her campaign and her supporters have really tried to put this focus on the ABs and, you know, the 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 implication there that in that Ganem and his allies and the Democratic machine, the Democratic town committee stole the September 10th primary. Um, but there are there are legitimate questions about how Marilyn Moore failed to get on the ballot as a third party candidate. And she had a she had a forum, a community forum about a week ago that I attended, and it wasn't it wasn't very well attended. Um, there were probably about a dozen folks there. Um, but one woman actually brought this up and she seemed to be someone who is a more supporter, but she was trying to learn a little bit more about her and learn a little bit more about her strategy and whether she had a chance tomorrow. And she did bring this up and she said, look, that, it, you know, it's a question out there for you, Senator. Um, if you couldn't do that, if you couldn't get on the ballot and, and, and manage something as simple as obtaining 207 petition signatures, how can you run Connecticut's largest city? Mm. Um, you know, it is, it is interesting here, too, because you have to remember a lot of times when absentee ballots are questioned, it's usually a partisan issue. Democrats tend to love absentee ballots. Um, Republicans tend to try and cast a lot of skepticism on that. In Bridgeport, because it's a Democrat-controlled city, you have Democrat versus Democrat. So you have a you have an interesting situation here where you have Democrat Marilyn Moore and her allies casting all sorts of doubt on absentee ballots. And the Ganem folks have been trying to turn that against them and have been accusing Moore and her allies of voter suppression. There have been a couple of rallies by community re- leaders, religious leaders, all of them affiliated with Ganem, who are basically trying to take her allegation that Ganem somehow cheated the absentee ballot system and turning it on her and saying, this woman and her campaign, they're trying to negate your vote. They're trying to prevent you from voting. Um, so it's a really interesting dynamic that's going on right now. Mm. Meanwhile, I should mention the Connecticut Post editorial board has endorsed a write-in vote for State Senator Marilyn Moore for mayor. I was wondering if that has ever happened before where you have a major newspaper endorsing a write-in candidate, Brian. I've, uh, that's a really good question. I couldn't tell you that. I, yeah. you know, I wasn't involved in the endorsement. Yep. Um, I know it was consistent with they had endorsed her in the primary as well. Um you know, she is, I mean, this is the thing. Oftentimes, oftentimes write-in candidacies, and I don't, they do seem to, they could, they do seem to be a frivolous effort. I mean, we do have some other folks in Bridgeport who are write-in candidates, and they were last minute, and they're making no effort in any way, shape, or form, other than maybe a letter to the editor, um, to really get themselves out there. They just have no, they have no way of connecting with voters. They have no money. Um, It's too late in the game. They just started a few weeks ago. You know, Ms. Moore does have a Senate track record. She does have a following. And so she is different, I would say, than from your average write-in candidate. Um, You know, I would still I would still say that the good money is on Joe Gannam winning tomorrow because he has all of the advantages. Mm -hmm. Um, But it is going to be fascinating to see how well she does.
And the Gannon, the Gannon folks are also very sensitive. They want to make sure they win on the machines tomorrow. They do not want this to be another win just by absentee ballot. So there's going to be a big focus on turnout for Joe Gannon at the polling places. We'll have to leave it there. Uh, Brian Lockhart, always a pleasure talking with you. He covers Bridgeport for the Connecticut Post. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalbathanchel. Coming up, we're going to zone in on Middletown, an interesting race there. And you can join us as well. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalbathanchel. Don't forget, tomorrow is Election Day, November 5th. We've been uh, focusing in, focusing on some of the uh, municipal races around the state. We wanted to shift now to Middletown, Connecticut. And joining us by phone, Kathleen McWilliams, who's a reporter for the Hartford Current. Kathleen, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on, Lucy. We just got a tweet from Molly uh, who writes, I'm planning to vote tomorrow in Middletown for the candidates that I feel best align with our city's future and Middletown Public Schools. So she's casting a vote for Ben Florsheim. Let's let's talk about him. Uh, surprise primary win in September. And who is he? Ben is a 2014 graduate of Wesleyan University um, who stuck around Middletown for the last couple of years and has gotten more and more active in democratic politics in the city. Um, He's 27 years old, so he's on the younger spectrum for political candidates in Connecticut. Um, But people, you know, like Molly, um, are throwing their support behind him because they think he has a fresh vision for the city. Um, He's not really entrenched in the sort of old boys um, corner of Middletown politics um, and has a really sort of optimistic vision for the city. That's interesting. Uh, You mentioned not entrenched in the the machine in Middletown, Connecticut, because his challenger, Republican Seb Giuliano, he's somebody that would be would fit that description. Yeah. So this is a really interesting race because, you know, both Ben and Seb are sort of polar opposites on paper, so to speak. Um, Seb is 67 years old. He was mayor from 2005 to 2011. Um, Since 2013, he's been the minority leader on Middletown's Common Council. Um, He spent his entire life in Middletown. Um, You know, when I was out walking around with him as he canvassed, you know, people would drive by and say hi. You know, he's, he's definitely the known entity. So tell us, what are some of the issues that are besides uh, the candidates that will bring people to the polls? Uh, We heard Molly mention or in her tweet, she said that public schools is is top of mind for her. Yeah, and that's definitely one of the hot topics. Um, Middletown public schools have been um, a huge conversation point um, through the forums in the primary and in the general election. Um, There's this perception that the schools um, need, you know, continued support. Um, that they're moving in this great direction, and whoever is mayor um, should be somebody to shepherd that process along. Um, ben has come out very strong on education, you know, vowing support for the Board of Education um, and whatever the superintendent's vision for the schools is. Um, and that's an area where Seb is sort of perceived as a little bit weaker um, by his opponents. Um, he, back during the last budget hearing um, process, sort of recommended um, – cuts to education funding. He wants to sort of merge city and board of ed functions so that the city has more oversight over things like taking care of the facilities. And that's not super popular among the Democrats. Um, So education is a huge issue. I think that sort of city infrastructure and city development is a huge issue. Middletown has um, really been strong on economic development recently, but both Ben and Seb want to look at growing the grand list and redeveloping the riverfront into even more of an asset than it is now. Oh, we mentioned earlier that uh, Republican Seb Giuliano uh, may appeal uh, to older Middletown uh, residents uh, now that uh, Florsheim uh, really uh, uh, had a really great uh, turnout for the September 10th primary. Do you expect a lot of these older residents are going to come to the polls in support of, of Seb Giuliano? I think that there's a strong chance that that will happen. Um, you know, normally I can sort of have a gut instinct about how these things are going to go, but I'm really not sure who's going to win. Um, Tomorrow, it's very hard for me to tell. I think Seb is probably going to capitalize on some support from older Democrats. Um, After September's primary, where Ben took um, more than double the amount of votes as his opponents, 
um, a lot of the sort of establishment Democrats um, anecdotally said they'd probably be supporting Seb. And last week, uh, Jerry Daly, a Democrat on the Common Council, came out endorsing Seb um, because he felt that Ben didn't have the relevant professional experience. Um, That said, I think Ben is going to win a lot more of the younger vote in Middletown, and as Middletown has sort of amassed more and more young people over the years, that really could go in his favor. That's interesting that someone would say that uh, Florsheim may not have the relevant professional experience, but he is a newcomer, and and that seems to really appeal to voters uh, these days, somebody that's going uh, against the establishment and new energy uh, to a particular uh, place. Yeah, I think particularly for Democratic voters, um, that is huge right now. I mean, last year we saw Will Haskell beat Tony Boucher in a very surprising upset. Um, And then nationally, we're seeing this all the time with people like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And I think that's really appealing in Middletown for Democrats that you have somebody who who does have government experience. Ben worked for Chris Murphy for five years um, and has certainly, you know, done a lot of state politics work in that regard. Um, But he doesn't have necessarily the city hall experience, um, which is something that Seb's campaign points to over and over again. Um, So it's really going to come down to whether people, you know, they want the fresh face with different types of experience or if they want somebody who's been in the job before for six years and has been active on the council for six years. Uh, Before we run out of time, uh, Kathleen, can you tell us about the write-in candidate? Uh, Who is she and who does she appeal to? So the writing candidate is Valika Clark. Um, She campaigned in the primary, um, and she didn't receive any votes, but she's running as a write-in candidate now. She describes herself as a community activist um, and a humanitarian, not a politician. Um, And she's basically just appealing to people who who don't want either candidate and would support, um, you know, her stance on social issues in the city and really sort of lifting up people, particularly in Middletown's North End. Um, She's, you know, put out a lot of good things for people to consider, and it'll be really interesting to see how many votes she gets tomorrow. That's Kathleen McWilliams, a reporter for the Hartford Current. Uh, Before we run out of time, uh, Ben's calling in from Wallingford. Uh, Ben, uh, you've got an interesting race uh, in Wallingford. Tell us about that. Uh, I just wanted to speak up for... uh Jared Liu and the Democrats running in Wallingford because uh, Wallingford has been uh, stagnant um, for a lot of years under Republican control. And I think Jared Liu and the Democrats can look to the future and uh, basically take us in a direction that's going to grow the economy in Wallingford and uh, take care of the people so that we can have growth and services instead of constant cuts Mm -hmm. and higher taxes. And we should mention that uh, Jared Liu, who you mentioned, is running against longtime Republican Mayor William Dickinson, Jr., a 36-year incumbent. Uh, But thank you, Ben, for letting us know uh, a little bit about what's happening in Wallingford uh, here on Where We Live. Uh, Kathleen McWilliams, we want to thank you for joining us to talk about Middletown. And again, don't forget, tomorrow is the municipal uh, election day starting at 6 a.m. here in Connecticut. Uh, many towns and cities across the state holding important races. Uh, Kevin M. on Twitter says, of course he's going to vote. And he writes, the Connecticut Working Families Party needs support. Uh, I'm Lucy Nopith Anshul. Today's show produced by Lydia Brown. Special thanks to our intern, Kevin Morrison, on the phones today. Our technical producer is Kion Wolf. And uh, just a quick programming note. Tomorrow, we're going to talk with Dwayne Betts, who's a celebrated uh, poet. He's a graduate of Yale Law School. And his latest collection of poetry, Felon, um, talking about uh, his time in prison, the experience of ex-offenders and others. We hope you join us for that as well.